Welcome to this week's episode of the Prep Athletics Podcast. I'm proud to have joining me Coach Drew Dawson from Choate Rosemary Hall. Now, Choate Rosemary Hall, known as Choate, uh, is one of the top five prep schools in the world uh, through rankings every year. They've got an amazing alumni list to include JFK, uh, Ivanka Trump, Jamie Lee Curtis, Bill Simmons, and many, many, many others, which we talk about on this podcast. Drew talks about going from Central Pennsylvania to playing D1 to being a D1 assistant coach for eight years and then his time as a prep school coach and thinking about new ways of doing things, thinking about being present. A really good conversation with Drew, and I think you'll like it a lot. So thanks so much for tuning in. Enjoy the podcast. Welcome to the Prep Athletics Podcast. This is Corey Heights. Some battles. I'm, I'm. I'm not sure if they got us. If they did, maybe. Maybe so you will get better as a player during that year. So it was kind of exciting. Like, oh yes, yeah, somebody wants me. Drew, welcome to the podcast. Great to be here. Appreciate it. Good to see you. Yeah. Good to see you too. And you played college basketball at Lafayette. And my question for you is, where did you come from, and how did you get good enough to play at the D1 level? Well, in, in terms of the D1 level, I did a lot of dishing and taking charges to stay on the floor. I can tell you that if you've met me, obviously you have. But at, at my size and and position in college, it, it was, uh, you know, I was a role player at Lafayette, but always had the dream to play at the highest level and was fortunate to do so. Uh, it seems like, uh, obviously, a little more hair ago and, and – uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera. I got done in 03. Um, but originally from Pennsylvania, Central PA, went to a, uh, you know, a powerhouse for that that area, Trinity Catholic, and just a uh, big football area, Corey. But I just caught the, you know, the hoops bug and and had a chance to, you know, be on the right teams. You know, it always takes, you know, it's a team sport, so you got to be in the right place with the right people and just was very fortunate, um, you know, to fall in love with hoops and and you know, and, and just pursue that. And I was fortunate to get recruited um, probably in terms of having an all around career. If you were engaging it on minutes and roles and everything, it was probably better suited for, um, you know, high D3. But I always had that dream of playing Division One, and was fortunate to follow that to University of New Hampshire. And then, you know, I finished up at Lafayette College in the Patriot League uh, for a legendary coach who who's since retired, but Fran O'Hanlon. So I was a part of you know, very fortunate to be a part of some of his championship teams there. Yeah, and when you were playing there, like, what was the best part of being in a D1 program? What was the most challenging part? I I would say, you know, obviously beyond just the the hype of Division One, you know, and, and even that has changed. You know, you and I have talked a lot about, you know, one of the things, uh, and I'm sure, you know, your listeners know, you know, you're big on the educational piece with your platform. And, um you know, one of the things that, that, that kids need to be educated to, especially today is, and, and they know this organically because they're very much a part of the social media uh, craze and, and the different technologies and live streaming. But, you know, when I played back in the late 90s, early 2000s, there was that added hype of, you know, playing on TV or, you know, at the highest level, getting uh, the added media attention, you know, and, and that certainly had an influence. You know, you, you never want any decision to be too extrinsic, right? But um, certainly when you're a kid coming up through a sport that you love and trying to pursue it at the highest level, you know, the, the glamour of Division One was there, you know. Um, but it's amazing how many different avenues these kids can get uh, attention and, and support it, you know. Um, but for me, it was a lot of it was just wanting to pursue at the highest level. And, um, you know, Lafayette was just a great opportunity for me to do that. Yeah, absolutely. And I think people that play the D1 level need to share with kids nowadays these these experiences so they know, like, hey, it's not all the March Madness highlights you see uh, come tournament time. Like, it's a grind, not just during the season, but in the off season as well. And, you know, you went from, you know, playing in D1 program and becoming a D1 assistant coach for a long time Talk to me about that. Like, what did you learn during your time at Lafayette, at Hartford, that you incorporate now as a prep school coach? Yeah, and and just you know, just what you said. I mean, obviously, just starting out, you're you're you know answering your questionnaire with you know what was the things I learned at at Lafayette in Division One, and certainly you know in a different capacity as a coach, but a lot of the same themes is once you get past the glamour of it, the hype of it, 
Um, you know, and again, I think every kid at every level is feeling that now just because of the trickle down. Obviously, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm sure we'll talk a bit about the portal and NIL and how that's affected things. But, you know, the reality is it, every level is so competitive. And that was the biggest wake up call I had. You know, I was from a small Catholic school, you know, private school in central PA where, you know, we had maybe a half dozen, dozen division one uh, basketball players, you know, some other football players that went on to play division one, but it wasn't relatively speaking, you know, outside the central PA bubble, very, very highly successful program. Larry Koslack, who's actually still there and has, you know, 800 plus wins as a high school coach. But once I got out of there and, and, and again, started out, you know, in the America East at, at the University of New Hampshire, it was just that wake up call that, you know, this thing never shuts off. I mean, there's no there's no possessions off. There's no days off. There's no practices off. Um, so I think the biggest thing, and I'm sure you've heard this from a lot of players and coaches, you know, not to sound cliche, but it's just making the mental, emotional uh, adjustment. You know, a lot of people talk about the game, the speed of the game and the strength of the game. I think that has a lot to do with, you know, who you're, you know, specifically who you're referring to. I mean, I think some kids are college ready coming out, especially coming out of prep school. But I think you can't avoid the mental and emotional, the mind-body adjustment uh, that you have to go to when you um, start to face the highest level, you know, of anything you do, but certainly relative to what we're talking about, college basketball. And, that, and that's the thing that is most, um, you know, I think emphasized when you go to, you know, Division One, And I think it's only getting more intense with, you know, it getting older, you know, just in general, you know, again, with the NIL and, the, and excuse me, the portal, but obviously also the, the influences the NIL and the landscape changing. But uh, but that was probably the biggest thing. And then as a coach, you try to, you know, remember those days. I mean, I don't think every former player makes for a great coach, but you try to keep in mind the experiences you had as a former player. And again, for me, I had some ups and downs in my career as a, as a, you know, ultimately a role player. I think I settled into that. You know, I went through the same adjustment that a lot of teenagers and kids go through. Uh, but once you sort of recalibrate that and, and you know, you, you maintain your love and passion for the game, you know, you can get in. And there's and, and I say to my kids at Chota all the time, like everyone counts on this squad. I mean, everyone plays a role and, and it's tough to get kids depending on where they came from, what their role was at their previous spot. You know, it can be a tough adjustment and buy-in, but it's, as you know, it's a beautiful thing when you start getting kids to truly understand the idea of organization. You know, we always say every year is a startup for us. This is a new startup. You know, we need to build our, you know, not to sound cheesy, but we have to build our basketball business. In this case, it's a basketball team trying to compete, you know, compete the right way and, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So I think you try to do that as a coach, certainly at the college level where every kid is coming from a situation where they were the man, they were the top dog. And you try to get them to make that transition uh, as efficiently as possible so they can continue to, you know, enjoy. It's not always an easy road, but enjoy why they started out on this path to begin with and, and getting them to, and a lot of that is getting them to understand the power in everyone can contribute in some capacity. It may not look the same, you know, when you were at whatever high school or prep school, but everyone plays a part in this. And if, if you do that, the process of that and, and the result of that, first of all, the journey, the process, but the result, you may not get everything you want or have the experience exactly how you envisioned it, but there's something to be said about, the team and there's something to be said about um, managing up, you know, and managing your environment to, um, you know, to contribute and, and, and feel the rewards of that, especially if you're a part of a successful program or team. Yeah. I love that. Let me ask you this though. Um, what do you do when kids uh, come to you and they say, Hey, I want to come to Choate. Also my goal is to play D one, knowing the current reality of how the game is older now, how the transfer portal is kind of King. How do you handle that with players and families with those high expectations? Well, it's becoming, and I, I'm right now asking other coaches what they're doing. You know, the whole idea of you can't tell your kids to be coachable and not be coachable yourself. You know, I'm uh, right in the in the midst of that, of, of trying to pick brain and talk to other coaches about, you know, some of their strategies. Because, you know, everything I just said, <clears throat> excuse me, everything I just said for the last couple of minutes, just, you know, on some of your early questions here all sounds cute at the end of the day if you don't have some type of you know uh 
process tailored, especially coaching prep school. Like they're coming to prep school. These kids are coming. These families are committing to prep school, uh, to prep school for a certain reason. You know, obviously you would hope in recruiting families. Like I heard, you know, um, a Coach Hurley video not too long ago just about, you know, in essence, you recruit families just as much uh, as the player, you know, what voices are these players listening to? You know, um, tell me the voices they're listening to. I'll tell you the decisions they're making. So the bottom line is you want, you want to hopefully have a good canvas that you're working from, but then you have to be able to lean into and prove to them that you understand the, the, the process specifically of the, of college recruitment and the college decision, uh, decision process. And, I think a lot of that right now, again, not to toot your own horn and, you know, we've known each other for a long time, but education, you know, there has to be a heavy educational piece uh, and it has to be broad, you know, as, as much as I'd like to think I've had a pretty good run at this as a coach at different levels, you know, I've been very fortunate in my career to, uh, you know, coach at the highest level in division one, you know, I've had short stint overseas. Uh, I've been at, at Choate for a while now you know, that's one voice. And especially when they're trying to make a very subjective set of decisions and, and it gets very myopic because there's, you know, the cost of education is out of control in this country. You know, just again, the, the portal, the influence that's had on college recruiting, the NIL, which is only complicating it from a, you know, from a sense of urgency for these families and kids to create a brand for themselves in a given moment. So, I think, you know, you do become one voice regardless of what your resume looks like. And I think uh, there's powers in numbers and, you know, a platform like yourself. That's why I was, again, I'm very appreciative to be on here and just educating them and showing the data. You know, it was, what, less than three, Corey, to begin with, that go on to play uh, competitive college, you know, basketball, either one, two or three. And now you mix in the world's very flat and international recruiting. And then, and then you look at the numbers at Division One influenced even more so as I'm, you know, repeating myself, but just with the NCAA, you know, transfer portal and, and those percentages get dire. So it's not impossible. There's still every year you're going to have high school kids go on to the highest level and then the domino effect from there, but just trying to educate them and not starting in November, you know, when, when a kid commits to Choate, you know, in the spring, you start to have those conversations. You know, there's the recruiting piece. You've recruited the kid, the family to Choate. Obviously, some of those questions are being asked naturally along the way in terms of them making a the decision, trying to get a feel for the coach they're going to send their kid to, the kid's going to play for. But then you want to start to have a set of conversation that you know, is a little more specific to, you know, adding on to maybe previous conversation about what they have to improve at. They have it. You know, the one thing I'll say, not to sound wordy, but what about getting better? You know, I don't want to sound like one of those coaches, you know, um, but it's it's a, it's amazing how quickly the, the, the uh, you know, a conversation, you know, and, and a little bit below the surface conversation where there's a healthy ego. Uh, and, and it's not just me being on a bully pulpit. Like I learn more from the kids than what they don't understand. Is you learn more from your players than than they do from you. Right. I mean. I keep getting a little bit older. We, you know, Corey, you and I keep, well, I'll tell you that that beer looks pretty good, man. I must say, but uh, maybe it's just the fact that um, I don't have quite as much up top that I noticed that, but the bottom line is we keep getting older and they stay the same. So we learn plenty from them, but what about the, the healthy conversation around, first of all, just your mind, body development, your player development, and, and using that as a tool to increase your odds at maybe being in the shop window for the level you, you aspire to be at, you know? Um, and I've been fortunate, the kids I've recruited, we've had those conversations, but then you quickly got to move it towards, and that, you know, a very heavy, um, excuse me, heavy educational piece on, these are the realities of, of recruiting right now. And if you don't take my word for it, you need to find voices and we need to put voices in front of you that can paint, uh, this reality where it sinks in a bit. And then from there, we're not trying to, you don't want to ever kill a kid's dream, but let's make sure we, you know, we navigate here and we keep certain options open. I mean, because at the end of the day, it's finding the right fit, right? So maybe a little bit of a tangent there on that answer, but um, kind of shooting from the hip and, and what I'm thinking about as a coach. And I'm trying to have a lot of conversation to to gain more insight on what other coaches are doing. Uh, I've just sat down with my AD to end the year and you know, he was asking me about some things we can do. And, and I said, hey, let, let's possibly bring in some outside voices that are very credible 
Um, not that we don't have good resumes across our coaching staff, you know, across every sport, but let's continue to put, you know, let's not be myopic, even the way we're presenting it to our student athletes, because it's not just basketball, as you know, you know, um, and let's just continue to educate these kids from different angles. Um, Because one thing I will say is kids these days, kids these days, there you go, but kids these days have more access to information than ever before. Now, I think that's good for a couple reasons. I think that's good. I think it's good and bad. But the good side of it is this, is that um, I think they're very resourceful. So instead of having to always lead them to water, I think you just kind of, you know, put them in the right direction, put some, some guard rails around them, you know, because you have to coach and mentor. But they, they're very resourceful. And, you, and, and, um, and, and they'll find the information. So there's a level of, you know, authenticity and truth as a coach you need to, 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 to come with to, you know, to get the message across. If not, it's quickly skewed. It's discredited. So I think in some ways, you know, the coaches have to continue to get better and evolve, right? And then the players, the bad side, the good and the bad, is the bad players, you know, there's no ignorance is bliss. You do have the information. You are resourceful. You know, you understand how to get to certain things, whether it's through, you know, the technologies or social media or whatever else, you know, the World Wide Web. But then if you continue to get feedback, whether it's one voice, the coach, or numerous voices, you know, uh, depending on how that's presented to a kid, then you have to then navigate the realities, the information at hand. And I think that's where, to your point, just going back to being the question, I think that's where things can get a little goofy is, you know, we're not magicians here. It doesn't matter if, if I'm a former Division One coach, player or not, you know, um, it's about collecting data, obviously getting better, being in the right shop window, doing all those things, which you obviously help kids find the right fit for prep school. But given those things and given the kid is on a path to um, to be recruited, et cetera, et cetera, you know, it's it's getting the information and then assessing the appropriate response and navigating from there. And I think all that sits on a pretty heavy educational piece at this point in time. Yeah, absolutely. But, you know, you talk about getting better. And one thing I think about immediately is when you talked about before we got in the call, meditation and how you've got your players meditating now and doing yoga, which I think is great because it's time for them, you know, to not have any outside influences come in. But then you talk about getting better. I wonder how much development, both in the classroom, both socially, both on the court and, 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 improving a kid's basketball IQ is missed out on because they're spending their time on their phones, right? Just, just wasting time or connecting that way. And mm -hmm. you're working with the youth of today on a daily basis. Do you see the phone affecting potential time in the classroom, time on the court, social connection? I mean, the short answer is because I've given you a few wordy answers. So the, the short answer is I do think it's had an effect. Okay. Um, I think probably, but you could also go, both ways with that, right? So I'd say in terms of coaching, the negative effect would be, and as young people, I mean, you know, if you think back to when, I mean, I'm 44 years old when I was even 24, but certainly when I was 17, 18 years old, you know, just truly understanding the power of presence and being in the moment and maximizing the moment. You know, I do a corny thing with the kids where, you know, walk in a straight line and put one foot in front of the other, you know, and, and I'll say these are, and they're looking at me like, you know, I'm walking like, a, I look like a duck, you know, I'm walking across the court and they're, you know, usually huddled up or on the sidelines. I said, every foot, every step is, is the present moment, is a moment in time. And if you can really sharpen your ability and begin to understand you know, how to be present, you know, how to be in the moment and then within the moment, you know, be the best version of yourself and navigate your environment. In this case, a basketball team, a practice, a workout, a game, whatever. And you can get pretty good at that. You don't even have to get great at it because you'll never arrive to perfection in that. Right. But if you can get pretty good at it, you know, now it's like that old saying, you know, the saying that if you tell the truth all the time, you don't need to remember. Like you're putting one moment in front of the other. And that naturally is going to be a huge deterrent and a huge way to combat all the distractions that come at you and certainly via technology and phones and devices. So simply what you do is, you know, and I know I'm not, I'm one of hundreds and thousands of coaches turn, there's no devices in the gym. 
You know, we do a team meal, we collect the phones. You know, uh, if the phone goes off, you know, it can be in a bag, you know, it can be in their book bag or gym bag, you know, depending on what, the, obviously I'd show you the locker room, but um, if it's, we're on the road at a game or something like that, you know, if it's in the bag or on the bus, we shouldn't hear it, you know? Now that takes, that takes a lot of will on the part of our, our coaches and our staff, you know, to, to, a little to, bit of will on the kids part, just turn the and, button on. Yeah. Right? <laughs> turn that, well, I appreciate you saying that because there you go. Like giving in, you know, I don't think it's actually, a, you know, I, I, I appreciate you putting me on the spot there. I actually don't think it's a big deal to put it on mute. I don't think it's a big deal to, to not pull it out or not bring it into, you know, certainly a, a space where you're going to, you know, work out and get better and, and play basketball. But again, I, I think there's been so many, these kids have, had such an influx of these technologies and devices and all the things you can do. And listen, I'm Corey, I'm, I'm a big fan of technology. I, you know, you and I know each other well enough to know that. I mean, just look at, you know, I'm looking at this screen and, and, and this platform and, and you know, the, this podcast software, I mean, this is, it's great, you know, and it's created such a flat world where it doesn't matter what age you are yet. We have so much access uh, to information and things we can, can harness to, to become a better better person, human, coach, whatever you're into. Uh, but I think, especially for kids at, at a stage that they're in, you know, that we get them in, in, in prep school, you just have to make sure that it's within reason. So I think one of the biggest ways to start educating them on that is forget even what the technology is. It could have been the TV in the 50s. It's more of, you know, understanding the power of presence and the power of mind body connection you know it doesn't matter if you're present if then you're not you know the stimulus response isn't there with the body that's why you have to be stretched that's why you have to be hydrated you know that's why you, have, you need good nutrition you know it all goes it's all interconnected you know unfortunately i've learned some of these things and i've started bought buying more into these things you know a little bit later i wish i would have known or bought you know people would put some of this stuff in front of me but i wish i would have committed to it as a player and during my playing days, you know, I'm starting to flirt with it, but I I've really bought into it as my own life unfolds and I get a little older, but certainly as a coach and with every year it's, you know, you're trying to, uh, you know, the X's and O's to me, and, and there might be coaches that listen to this that would totally disagree. I mean, I believe the X's and O's maybe 10% and you can argue the percentage point. The concept is, if you've been coaching long enough, you're you're never complacent. You're always trying to get better at a at a bounce play to your arsenal, right? Something out of a timeout. You know, of course you need to have situational play and time and score and things you'll call and just a general X's and O's philosophy and approach to that. But once you get to a reasonable level of that, right, I think more of the time needs to be spent on between the ears with players. And and I know this isn't a new thing. There's a ton of content out there with people speaking to the, the psychology of it and the mind body of it. But man, am I so bought into that? I mean, the game is maybe 10% X's and O's and 90% psychology, you know, and I think the biggest thing is, you know, full circle to your question. If you can get the kids to buy into the fact that you're not BSing them, you're putting real stuff in front of them. Maybe not always right. They may not always agree with it. But if you really get them to understand that you care, you know, not only in your actions, but the information, like in this, this whole thing with prep school and deciding on prep schools and your, your platform is about, you know, putting the right information and the right navigation for these kids to have opportunities and pick the right prep schools, right? And you've been very good at that. But there's an authenticity that I've picked up on with what you do, you know, and it's the same thing. Like you need to show them they care before they care what you coach, say, do, et cetera. And I think that's, that's it. You know, I, I don't know if that's what you're looking for, you know, if that's aligned with what, where you're going with the conversation or that, that last question, but that's shooting from the hip. That's, that's me. And that's what we're trying to do at show. Never perfect as you know, but you know, it all rests on people and kids and a lot of chemicals that run across our head every day. Yeah. And you mentioned it, that just got me thinking about if I was in college 25 years ago, the things I would do different now, such as hydrating when I wake up in the morning, mm -hmm. taping my mouth while I sleep, meditating just 10 minutes a morning, not drink four Mountain Dews at night uh, while studying, you know, to not fall asleep, eating a little bit better. You know, just those things there could have made a 10 to 20% difference 
physically, you know, um, taking naps when, when available versus messing around. So there's a trade off between doing healthy stuff, but we're in our middle forties now, Drew, and we know this stuff to, yeah. you know, an yeah, extra 25 yeah, yeah. years of experience, but now we're trying to tell kids the same stuff. Now right. that we know it, whether kids pay attention to it or not is one thing, but you know, the information's out there, all the information's out there. There's really no secrets anymore. So it's up to coaches now. It's up to parents to do research. It's up to players to decide what they want to do and then go forward with it. So there's no secret sauce anymore. It's out there for everybody. Now put the phone down, get your sleep, get your studies in and do what you got to do to make yourself marketable to a college coach. Right. Well, this is, this is going to sound very, um, first of all, I wanted to ask you the taping. It, it broke up just a, a tad there, but the taping of the mouth, I, I'm not aware of that. What's, uh, can you, can you not to veer off, but can you, the, is, yeah. we can talk about where everyone on this podcast yeah. drew. So just know that, um, I learned seven years ago when I did a, uh, three day clinic with Gabby Reese and Laird Hamilton at their house in Malibu about a lot of breathing, a lot of cold weather, a lot of heat, a lot of exercise. And one of the things that came away that I do every day there is one, I drink, um, a whole Mason jar of water with Himalayan sea salt. First thing in the morning, when I wake up. Mm. Secondly, I do breathing exercises slash meditation every morning. Mm. And then this is when I got into the sauna and the ice. But one thing I learned is taping your mouth shut is very beneficial at night when you're sleeping to get good quality breathing in, right? Now, the nose was physiologically, physiologically built to breathe through, right? Your mouth was built for talking and eating and to get big amounts of air in an emergency, right? That's when, when you do a sprint, you're... You're huffing and puffing because your nose just can't take in as much air. But your nose, you know, it pressurizes your air. It moistens your air. It filters out dirt and bacteria. And you get a much fuller breath, probably 10 to 20% more efficiency breathing through your nose than your mouth. That's why you never see horses or cheetahs panting, right? They've got big nostrils and they're the, some of the fastest animals on the planet. They, they nose breathe. When you see a prize fighter in a corner during, uh, in between rounds, they're breathing through their nose, right? So you pair mouth tape with like a, a breathe right strip that opens up your nose a little more and you sleep at night, there's a good chance you'll feel better in the morning. And I know that because I had a deviated septum growing up that I'd have surgery on. So I've been a mouth breather. It was for 40 years I breathed through my mouth. In the past seven, I've been taping it at night and I wake up more refreshed. Right. Wow. And if I have to sleep without tape on my mouth, I wake up feeling horrible. And I must have felt that way for 40 years without knowing any better because that was my baseline. Right. Yeah. So there's hostage tape that's out there. It's popular. I just get Scotch 3M micro pore tape yeah. on Amazon. It's harder to keep on with my beard I've got, yeah, but yeah. I do not sleep without it anymore. And that's one of the things I would have done at the academy. And one thing I'm just trying to let people know is that this is for breathing. And here's one last fact. Yeah. Yeah. When you start taping your mouth, and you don't breathe through your nose much, it, it can be closed off. But mm -hmm. through two to three weeks of breathing through it at night or during the day with tape on, your nose will expand and allow more air to come through. So you can change your anatomy through use of the nose. Mm -hmm. And I had to do that. And there's a guy that taught me how to do this. His name is Brian McKenzie. He still has a deviated septum. So he does everything through one nostril, but he's done it so much. His sinuses have opened up enough to where he can do the breathing he needs to 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 be comfortable with it. That's crazy. Well, I will tell you this though. I will say, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm ready for the nose. I got, you know, you know this, but I have three kids under four. So you we have exactly, a lot you of, absolutely need I, to do it then. Well, I pay the diapers around this house. I mean, that would be, uh, that would be interesting when expanded nose, like sniffing like a dog, smelling like a dog. But, um, now that's, that, that is, it's, it, you know, and this is a thing like all this different, all the different things that you can get, um, you know, certainly the flush, the, the salt, you know, um, you know, that's one, I mean, just, you know, the idea of like, we have a, we have a guy at, at show Brian Holloway and he's leaned into all this, you know, giving them a certain app on nutrition. And it's amazing. The kids will come back and they, and then they'll run with it, especially the kids that really want to play at a high level. And they'll start looking into, you know, a lot of this stuff, you know, whether it's exercise science, nutrition. And, you know, like we started the yoga and you always have the kids, some of the kids are looking at you like, it's, you know, it's taboo or what are we doing? By the sixth, seventh uh, 
you know, because certainly if I talked about taping your mouth, right, and I'm not sure I can go there with with Choate, you know, with we're, that's what we're going to do. I expect you to tape your mouth when you breathe, you know, the next week in the dorms, obviously, you know, but it's there's research behind it. It's, it's something it's, you know, uh, the fact you just spoke five minutes on it. My point is, is, you know, as goofy as some of this stuff will come off at first to a teenage kid, it's really neat to see if you can just put it in front of them and see if they run with it. And my kids with the meditation, like we use some called insight timer. Yes. Uh, we'll use it before games. We'll use it, you know, uh, you know, it, when we do it, you know, uh, at show, you know, and we do it different time. We definitely do it before games. That's something we've done consistently. Um, but we'll do it periodically um, with practice and other workouts, depending on what we feel the collective mindset, you know, and mind body level is of, of, of the team. Right. And, and I'm totally smitten on all this stuff. And, and, and the kids will eventually, again, going back to being authentic, like the kids will, even if they snicker and, and it's a little goofy to them at first, certainly if I talked about, you know, what you just spoke to about breathing and they're, they're going to look at you at first, I think like you have 16 heads, but as they do the, as again, resourcefulness, as they look into it, as they validate it, as they try and experiment and give it a fair shake. Like one of the things I look for in recruiting, you know, you hear a lot about, you know, what do you look for in recruiting? You know, I look for kids that are inquisitive. Like I, mm-hmm. like I, I, I want kids that, that uh, like, I understand that, you know, they're 18, 19, 17, 18, 19 year old kids. And, and obviously right now with where they're at on their maturity continuum, you know, the, 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 the bandwidth may be a little bit different, just like we're learning all these different hacks to health, um, you know, personal development, pop, 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 I mean, we could go around, around the farm about, you know, all those different avenues as you mature and grow, you know, that, that you tap into to just hack your life to try to be a little bit better, better version of yourself. Um, so they're, you know, at a different point in all that, right? And then college, your mind opens up even more, et cetera, et cetera. You know, but, but as much as you can, I try to lean into that. Uh, and you say, well, how do you do it? You know, just even recruiting calls, you know, even as simple as that, like, you know, try to get, you know, Coach Calhoun, Jim Calhoun, who when he unretired, I had a few kids go to, you know, from Choate to USJ. He he obviously had, as we all know, a legendary career as a head coach at UConn and then, you know, unretired, came out of retirement to help start the the Division Three program. It's now a top 25 program in a very short period of time. Glenn Miller's now the coach there and has done a great job. But uh, when he um, unretired, I had sent a couple of kids to him, I got to know him pretty well. I mean, I, you know, I, in many ways, consider him a mentor now. And, um, and the thing he would always say to me is Dawson, you know, find what the kids are interested in, you know, and find what they're interested in and lean into that, you know, and poke at that and, and, you know, and, and unpack that and you'll, you'll get the world from them. You know, you'll get the world from them. And that may not mean anything to do with X's and O's or basketball at a certain point in time, you know, or to start, but it's just, again, relationship building. You know, we always talk at Chode about, you know, return on relationships, you know, what, what's, what's, you know, what's our return on relationships and what's our return on engagement. You know, you need to have engagement before you even have a relationship. So we say, row. we all have, before we can even thicken the relationship and really build these lifelong, hopefully what become lifelong relationships, we, we need to row right? Return, ROE, return on engagement. So, and I give the idea about, you know, in order to even get on a path in a team setting, an organizational setting, you know, we can use the analogy of rowing the boat. If half of the boat, and you've heard the the whole thing about, you know, I'm not the first coach to use that analogy, but if one half of the boat is rowing, the other half is, and I'll ask the kids, which way is the boat going? Well, it's going in circles, right? So, we're headed this way. You know, we, this is what our goals are. This is what we're trying to do with this season, with this startup. So we need to row. We need to row. We have to agree on the framework, you know, framework before freedom, or rather freedom before framework. And that's chaos in a team setting. You got to set the framework, you know, and then you got to let the kids have, you know, have freedom within that and, 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 and feel their oats and be the player they think they can be and bring what they can bring to the court and expand their game. You know, obviously, maximizing strengths, minimizing weaknesses in a game setting. But the bottom line is, you know, once we're rowing, 
and we're moving in a certain direction as as a group, you know, that's where then you want to start to to get a return on those relationships, you know. And one of the things that helps, you know, I, I'm a big believer and you don't know your relationship until it implodes. You know, confrontation is the first sign of success with people. You know, it's easy to say you have a relationship with everything's good, you know, but when your relationship implodes now where is it now what kind of return can we get can we recalibrate it to get the return we wanted and envision you know between teammates but then collectively as as a program as a group and what helps with that and this is what i say to kids what helps with that is in that moment you can now look at the framework you can look at the return on engage this is when you get the return on engagement you know because we've engaged the mission statement we're moving in the right direction as a group Again, not always perfect. We're all individuals first. You know, I never tell kids to lose their individuality. I think that's silly. You know, when you when coaches bark at that, like we all played the game well before we thought we were going to be barked at by a, a mid forty, you know, forty something year old coach. So we're all individuals, but then we have to understand, you know, what framework are we navigating? What's our mission? What's the goal of this group? And then that's where you kind of get get everyone moving hopefully in the right direction where uh you know it just sets the table for hopefully a huge return on the relationships relationships the relationship with the game itself your love of basketball i see a lot of kids lose the love of the game prematurely um and i think they they lose the love of the game for the wrong reasons you know and so a lot of that is is sad to see you know as a coach um but you know, for the, for another, I guess, conversation. But the bottom line is we want to get a return on our relationships you know, with the game, with each other. Um, and I, it's amazing how, you know, I think all of us, Corey, but certainly young people, it, as you get older, you, you learn to compartmentalize your life because that's just the way it goes. You know, like if you're a father, if you're a husband, if, if you have to work two jobs or if you're working this job or working on this project, just all the different things that come at you, that come at you as, as an adult, you just are forced to learn how to compartmentalize, at least in certain moments, right? You know, situationally. I think kids, especially kids that have had a lot of success uh, in, in one thing. Right where it's I'm I've been very successful basketball and everything has kind of fallen fallen out of that even their academics you know um, you know they they do really good in school you know because they also know that's going to fuel basketball you know and obviously along the way vice versa and ultimately you know you want a forty year decision on your academic pursuits but the reality is, is you know a lot of kids aren't great at compartmentalizing their life you know. Um, early on. And I think teaching kids, again, being present to what you do, each compartment that, let's just take all right, this moment, this moment, let's be present to this. And then within this, let's engage it. And let's figure out, you know, you know, what's the framework going to be? What, what's the goal? What's the mission here? And then within that, what are the relationships that can be activated? You know, it goes back to resourcefulness, right? And And how can we get a return on that? And if you start looking at your life that way instead of, you know, what's the next feed or how can I edit this Snapchat? Like I tell the kids all the time, you cannot edit your life, you know, like you, you just can't. And that's the great thing about team sports is you're in the flesh, you're in the moment. You cannot, you cannot edit that. And um, so the best way to, you know, assure yourself that, that, you know, you don't have to edit it uh, is to just be present to it and to engage it, get a return on your engagement, <clears throat> excuse me, and try to get the utmost return on your relationships. Love it. Love all that, Drew. Let's do a pitch now for your school. Tell us about Choate Rosemary Hall and what makes it special and, you know, why kids should come there. Well, you know, I like to think it's, it's, it's just the basketball, right? And it's the success we've had as a basketball program. Uh, but it, it's a phenomenal school. Corey. I mean, you know, I, I appreciate you stopping by a couple of years ago. I thought you and I had a nice, you know, we, we had a good afternoon. It was it was overdue, uh, more from my end. So I appreciated you sticking with me and, and stopping by. And, um, you know, I, I'm sure you'd be the first to, to say, like, when you walk around Choate, you know, when I was a um, uh, an assistant, uh, more so in the Patriot League, because obviously Choate's a top 
it's a top five, you know, year in and year out. You can split hairs on whether it's Exeter or Andover or Deerfield or a couple others. But the bottom line is, you know, Choate and those other schools I just mentioned are are some of the best schools in the world. And yeah. um and I'm I'm I come from a background where there's many ways to be successful. You know, I, I there's a lot of ways because I, I think I would not be myself here if I got too caught up in, you know, pitching rankings. Like I, I definitely think there's a lot of ways to be successful in life and become educated, et cetera, et cetera. So I'll just say that as a side, a side comment. However, if you're going to play in this world of, you know, pursuing a certain tier of boarding school or prep school, you know, Choate's among the best. I mean, it's top five every year. Um, you know, when I was, as I was starting to say, when I was an assistant at Lafayette College, many times when I drove off um, Choate's campus, again, when I was a college coach, I used to say to myself, I, you know, if I ever recalibrate my coaching career and pursue a prep school, uh, this would be, to me, I think it's one of the best in the country. And I know it's easy for me to say that, and it's certainly biased, but um, in every school, every situation has their warts, you know, uh, the good, bad, the ugly. But I think for the most part, between the school that Choate is, you know, just, you know, those rankings, but also what's behind it. Um, you know, it's one of the bigger prep schools, you know, so if you're looking for a situation where, especially for post-grads, if you don't want to, you know, go back to a smaller school environment, or you want to feel like you're truly making that step from high school to college, you know, we have almost a thousand students. So that's one of the larger prep schools in America. Uh, I think that's a neat compliment to also having, uh, being able to preserve, you know, the height and academics and, and the student to teacher ratios. I mean, they're very small, Socratic type um, academic environments, you know, in the classroom. You know, it's very, uh, it's intense. It's a, it's, a, it's a really good school academically. But I say all that as a preface to say that, you know, one of the things that you hope for is that you can do, you can, you, you can do the best of both. And basketball wise, athletically, you know, our department has been very much supported. I mean, we have multiple championships. You know, I say this with a lot of humility, but you, you obviously said, you know, it's a plug for our school. I think it's a great situation for kids. I feel very fortunate to be the head coach at Choke, you know, especially after seeing the other side of it as a Division One coach for, for nearly a decade. I think it's a, it's a good spot where, you, you know, the best way to sell something is to have a good product to sell. And I think Choke, between its top five academics every year, you know, we were three this year in terms of national rankings. Um, you know, the support we've gotten for sports, specifically basketball. I've been very fortunate to have won a couple championships uh, in my time at Choate, you know, eight seasons minus COVID at Choate. Um, and then the other thing I, I, I really have taken an interest in and, and really uh, admire about what we're doing is we walk the walk in terms of a lot of things that we're talking about in communities and society. I mean, you look at, you look at our our uh, student body, and it, it's a very dynamic place. And we have obviously geographical diversity, but we have socioeconomic, racial, you know, religion. It's just a very walk the walk dynamic community and place to work at and coach at. And certainly with coaching, the whole idea of coaching in a lot of ways and what might separate it a little bit from teaching or teaching a specific subject matter is is guiding kids and getting kids to understand at the end of the day, it's how you cross pollinate information to get to where you want to go, the decision you want to make, the performance you want to have. So it's awesome to see that bleed out of our program in the gym and be very much a part of what the Choate ethos is, you know. Um, but simply put, you know, obviously you're not getting that word in your first conversation with a family or kid. But simply put, you know, when you tell a family that, hey, this is going to be a top tier basketball experience. You know, I'm very fortunate my staff. I have two assistant coaches that both played at a scholarship level. Both played. Kamar Bailey, who was a scholarship division two player at University of New Haven, <clears throat> excuse me, at New Haven was also a scholarship level quarterback. And then Caitlin Skinner, who ironically enough, I didn't know because I had moved on from the University of Hartford as associate coach, but um, had a, a nice career under Jen Rosati. Uh, at the University of Hartford, and um, and now as a math and science teacher at Choate and a part of our staff, helps out with boys basketball. So, you know, I think we just have a very, um, 
you know, it's 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 a it's a one two punch. I mean, we have the best of both at Choate, and uh, and then obviously all that sounds cute if you don't say it's about players, it's about student athletes. If you don't have, you know, you can have all that again going back to framework, but if you don't get kids to, you know, see the value in a place that has the great academics, dynamic community, and obviously a supportive basketball program. It won't matter. I mean, you need talent to see all that come to fruition, whether it's a student in the classroom, a kid that's open minded enough to interact with all different walks of life or an athlete on the field or, you know, my case, point guard, you know, wing, whatever, whatever I'm recruiting in that given uh, given cycle. But I, I, I feel very fortunate in terms of the plug that that you're giving me the opportunity to, to make. And here's the other thing I'll say, Corey. I feel like a college coach now, like I get a lot of I get a lot of you know, buddies of mine, colleagues of mine, you know, and a lot of them, there's a lot of chatter. Um, you know, it's a noble profession, but it can be a little bit of a crappy business. You know, I'd probably use another word, but, um, but it's a noble profession when done right. And, and there's a lot of good people in basketball, you know, and um, that I think <laughs> motives and intent are in the right spot. But obviously, you know, talk about dynamics, the, the, the business is, is it's, a, it's an interesting business to say the least. Right. And, um, so you get a lot of you get that constant chatter about what's going on in IL, the impact of the transfer portal on teams. You know, we're putting teams together, and not maintaining program. Everything in between, all the different stuff that coaches will water, you know, water cooler talk about, and they'll inevitably ask about, you know, what's it like to coach prep school. And it's not to sound arrogant or anything like that, but it's a quick response. Like it's a great level to coach at. You know, I feel like a small college coach now you know uh, obviously the recruiting goes into prep school you know the different things we've talked about for the last half hour or so but you know one of the things that that i highlight at the prep school level is the former coaches you coach against and that's where i'm going with 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 this this these comments here it's like every game not only do you have the influx of talent because post pandemic as you know Corey, and i do think it's a smart thing you know i can't speak Every kid's situation is a little different. But again, if you're in this world of looking into prep schools and, and you understand what it, you know, the good, bad and, and the benefits of it, you know, in general, the benefits of it, um, I think it is a, it's a good thing. I think it is very beneficial, you know, to give yourself another year to develop. Now, I'm speaking more at the post-grad level, but obviously at show we have reclasses. I know reclassification is a big thing in, in the prep school world. Also, we had success with kids coming in for multiple years. In fact, my starting backcourt are both kids that came in and reclass. But that's a little bit more sensitive because that is definitely situational. I think some kids leave their high schools for the wrong reasons, right? Um, so that's a little bit of a different conversation. But I think, you know, just from selfishly from a coaching standpoint, um, I think I feel like a college coach now, you know, again, because of the recruiting, all the different things mentioned, but just the, the level of coaches, you know, the players, yes, right? Because there's been this influx, especially post pandemic, to give yourself another year of a, plat uh, of a platform for recruiting or getting better. Um, but then the coaches that are coaching these players, uh, they're all former college coaches. So it's, it, I think it's been a great level for me, a great speed for me. You got to wear different hats, you know, when you're at this level to, to continue to move your life forward professionally and, and financially. But, but it's been a, um, yeah, it's been a, it's been a nice ride. So I, and I think Choate's a, can be a wonderful spot, uh, for a lot of kids. It's not for everybody, but I think it can be a, a a great stepping stone or a great school situation for a lot of kids uh, across the country, but we also recruit internationally. Love it. Love it. Thanks for sharing that. And we're going to play a fun game now called, right. I'm going to find out if you know who the, these alumni are from your school. Okay. okay. Here we go. Now the I problem said to my was, wife too, I said, I know something's going to come. I just know Corey. So there's going to be some type of hot seat. There is a hot seat at the end. We'll do quick hitters. But this is, yeah, let me know who, if you know who these alumni are, okay? Yep. So it's a test of your school knowledge. Yep. A guy named John F. Kennedy. Let me see. Yes. That's good. <laughs> but they have a great, great statue of him in the library and a and, uh, nice display of him. And Now, you know he spent most of his time at Choate uh, in the infirmary. So what's kind of funny about that is, yes, he's an alum, and and the head of schools, you know, he struggled academically when he was at Choate, 
and because he was sick most of the time, right? And he spent most of the time in the wing of now what's our admissions building, but the, but back then it was the infirmary. And so he was struggling uh, academically and the head of schools, that name, I, I don't, I don't remember who the head of schools was at the time, um, but literally wrote a, a raving recommendation for John F. Kennedy, knew his upside, you know, co- the, we're all coaches, right? Saw the upside mm-hmm. in this young man and wrote a, uh, a raving recommendation, got him into Harvard. Obviously his family was well connected and successful, uh, but went on to Harvard and, and the rest is history with with his career, of course, but, but yeah, he's one of our, in fact, I appreciated that tweet, um, some time ago. So John F. Kennedy. Yeah. That was a gimme. Here's number two, Jamie Lee Curtis. Yes. Jamie Lee Curtis. In fact, Stephen Farrell. Well, first of all, um, I have an assistant, Stephen Farrell, who's worked, you know, when you're coaching at this, although I, our staff now is, is really basketball heavy teachers and, and work other jobs around campus, but very um, basketball heavy. But I had an assistant for a long time, Stephen Farrell, who literally when he retired from Choate and stopped coaching with me, he was, you know, in his late 60s. And so he's worked every level of um of uh Choate. And so he was the director of development, either that or the associate director of development. So he got to to rub up against all these guys. In fact, he tells a story of when Ivanka Trump, who's another uh you know alum, and regardless of what your politics are, it's you know, but you you're mentioning different people that came to Choate, you know, uh President Trump came in a uh a helicopter and they weren't prepared for it. And so just the circus of trying to figure out, like, you know, and Stephen, you know, Coach Farrell tells a story of like they're literally like holding down the poles of the tent as he's told it. You know, I don't know. You know how it is. I caught a fish this big. It's like the stories yeah, yeah. evolve over time. But yeah, Ivanka Trump uh, is another Harrison Ford's daughter's, uh, Bill Belichick's daughter, I believe coached the show before going on to Wesleyan, if I'm not mistaken. Jamie Here's my last one. That's a le- yeah. legendary. Jamie, so those don't know, uh, she was in Halloween, original Halloween, and she won an Oscar recently for everything, everywhere, all at once. So, Jamie Curtis. And last one here, uh, which a lot of people may or may not know, but Bill Simmons. Bill Simmons, one of the the great. Uh, now, he has his podcast. What, what's you'll have to fill me a little bit with Bill Simmons. I mean, obviously, I have Bill Simmons in terms of his overall career, but. Didn't he have one of the number one speaking of podcasts for the longest time? I think it's right below this one, but yeah, ah, I think yeah. it's it's right up there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I, he adds probably eight more zeros behind yeah, his yeah, than mine. Right. But, uh, but he was one of the pioneers, though, wasn't he, in, this, in the whole uh, podcasting? Yeah, he's got a whole enterprise of different different media models now. Created 30 for 30, has the podcast, has the articles. Um, yeah, so anyway, just another Choate alum. So it's not always that heavy hitting when we do these with uh, certain coaches, Drew. So I had to really select between a who's who on your Wikipedia. In fact, there wasn't even, it wasn't even part of the Wikipedia page. It was its own Wikipedia page. Oh, uh, it's crazy. Just talking well, about I tell you this, just months. even on the ch- since I've been there, we've had um, great kids. It's amazing. Like you, you see some of these the, the names and the people and what they're doing, and and you know, and and there's a curiosity about what kind of upbringing those kids have. But I've had great kids that have come from some really successful backgrounds, but, you know, Ethan Schlager, uh, who went on to play at Colby, uh, is now in the, the Marine Corps as, as a, as a, uh, I don't know exactly the rank at this given moment, but has had a officer type career. His father, uh, Ivan Schlager, who was John Kerry's, uh, chief campaign advisor, you know, and was next in line to be chief of staff. If, if elected, um, just in the time I've been at show, you know, uh, Tessator's son, John Tessator, Joe Tessator, you probably know, did Monday Night Football for the longest time. Uh, I forget the game. What's the game now he's still involved with, but uh, on ABC, but, you know, a long time ESPN really got made inroads, uh, excuse me, inroads with broadcasting, et cetera, with boxing. Uh, Jim Murin, son, who went on the Johns Hopkins and played for, uh, you know, a buddy of mine in, in the business, Josh Leffler, who just took over at Loyola. It was on some of Josh's uh, Leffler's early teams at Hopkins, but he was a chairman CEO of MGM, Graham, which was huge, huge, uh, you know, uh, business there. And and um, and then his wife um, was in line to um, 
to uh, replace uh, Harry Reid as as mm-hmm. a senator in Nevada. So it's that's just in that's just in in you know the the seven or eight years I've been at show. But yeah, it's it's a it's a it's a who's who, and it's it's just it's a very dynamic place. Um, and uh, if it's if it's the right fit, the right recruit, you know, and 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 family, I I, I think it's uh, sky's the limit at a place like show. And I feel that way. Like I, you know, although I'm coaching, I, I get on a podcast like this, and I'm pretty definitive. And you're always trying to get better, and your philosophy evolves and changes in what you do. Uh, but for the most part, you know, I've had you know 15, 16 years behind my career at this point in coaching, and uh, so there's a level of confidence there. But at the same time you're always trying to get better. It's that whole thing of like, put yourself in an environment where, you know, you can be pushed and you can learn from others. And, and I feel like, forget even the kids, I feel like where I'm at in my career, the people I've met through Choate, um, people I've rub, rubbed up against, the people I've had conversations with, I mean, it's been a dynamic place for me, you know, even beyond, you know, just selfishly speaking there. But um, yeah, it's a good spot, man. It's a good spot. All right, we're going to finish up with some quick hitters now. All, All right. right. Best player you ever played against? Best player I ever played against. Um, the most embarrassing. Can I give it to? Can I? Does it have to be one? No, let's do two. The best. The most embarrassing best player. Most embarrassing moment was against Donald Hand, when I was a freshman. Um, I went in against Virginia, and he plucked me a half court in front of a lot of people. We were a guarantee game, but it was a time where, you know, it's not pro sports right where Charlottesville is. So uh, that was like a wake up call. But the best person, the best player, because we also played him twice. You know, Hofstra was in the America East when I started out at the University of New Hampshire. But Speedy Claxton was unbelievable. I mean, he was just unbelievable, you know. And I played against a lot of good players. You know, I, Lynn Greer, uh, you know, my AAU team you know, was, you know, and I just was talking to Joe, Joe Crispin, who's an assistant, you know, I think one of the great coaches in basketball, you know, uh, and certainly rooting, you know, I'm from Pennsylvania, grew up a Penn State fan, a lot of my family went to Penn State, but uh, Mike Rhodes is just a terrific, first of all, a terrific human being, uh, but a damn good basketball coach. And talk about how you do one thing is how you do everything. Like, so, you know, I'm rooting for him, know him, big Penn State fan, but Joe Crispin, was in the backcourt with me in AU, you know, and guys move around AUs and, you know, different AU clubs, but we had a, a stretch where it was Joe Crispin and Matt Carroll were, were the, you know, you remember Matt, Matt Carroll and the career he ended up having, you know. Um, so then we had a kid, Micah Davenport, who went to start out. I don't know if he finished at McNeese State. Lloyd Price, who was, uh, who was it? Uh, the tech school in, I can't remember, in, in Delaware. Uh, the Wilmington area, Votech, I'm not sure. Delaware Votech, I, 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 I can't think of that. But he ended up going to Xavier. So um, so I've played with and against a lot of really good players. But in college, going against Speedy Claxton, because naturally, and, I, you know, I'm 5'10", five, five, I was an undersized point guard. But um, but you see him, right? And, and, you know, on paper or whatever, on first sight, but, man, he could play. And he was so quick and so – he just could do things with the ball, you know, just playmaking ability and his ability to finish. And, I mean, he would he could get up in his athleticism and, and he just – his point guard play, he was just really neat to follow when I was a young player. You know, again, playing against him, but then just following him. And then obviously he's had a heck of a career um, at Hofstra. And, and a neat full circle with that is um, – you know, one of one of my kids is uh, had played for him. You know, Tyler Thomas just finished up at Hofstra, and I believe was mid major player of the year. But you know, it's been neat to to talk to Tyler with his NBA workouts. He 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 played for Benny Farmer, who's a dear friend of mine at Wilson Northampton. But he was a kid growing up that I'd worked with, um, and had done some club basketball with, and, and we're really rooting for Tyler to to make the nba certainly we'll go to europe and have a heck of a career over there but just a neat full circle because speedy class can to answer your question more than clearly more than the one word answer but he was the best guy um when i was playing but i was i played against a lot of with and a lot of you know good players so anyway it's a beautiful game 
Beautiful game, that's for sure. How about the biggest win of your career as a college assistant, as a player, or as a prep school coach? Well, the prep school, I mean, the win New England's. I mean, I, you know, that's the thing. And you know this, Corey. It, it is so competitive. New England prep school basketball, it's just so competitive. There's so many, again, good coaches, so many good players that come into the NEPSAC, whether it's triple A, double A, single A, all the way down. You know, sometimes the lower levels get discredited. But, you know, you look at Rivers. I mean, that's a, that's a heck of a program, you know, and he does a great job. And just there's different programs at different levels. But in general, um, it's just a hell of a uh, competitive environment. So to win New England's and, um, and, you know, to win that was in 2018 was just huge. You know, it was just it was huge. And it was our second only our second in school history. In fact, I was told just in the last decade or so, there's only three schools that have won two or more and showed mm-hmm. fortune to be a part of that. You know, Exeter, of course, has been a gold standard. You know, they've won four at this point, I believe, um, four or five, I believe. But, you know, Choate's won two and Williston's won two, you know. So that was a huge win, to huge one to win New England's. Uh, another one would be trying to think in, in – uh, I think it's when we beat Colgate in the first, as a player. I, I'd go back to player. It, it, it doesn't seem like on paper, if you're looking at it, it doesn't seem like a huge win. But again, I had an up and down college career for a lot of things, reasons and things we talked about and why you get into coaching. And a lot of coaching also, I think, is trying to get kids not to make the mistakes you made, right? And try to just put them on a little bit better path and a few percentage points you know, further along. But when my career had come full circle at Lafayette, uh, my senior year, we were total underdogs. We, had, you know, don't quote me, but we had some injuries and a kid or two left. And, and it was just a, it wasn't like a prototypical Fran O'Halen team during that era, that, that time frame. It was my senior year and um, role player, backup point guard, backing up a hell of a player in Andrew Pleck, who went on to um, have a great career in Sweden is now involved pretty heavily with Swedish basketball, but um, we had no shot to advance in a Patriot League tournament, and we had an upset over Colgate in the first round, and we lost. We ended up losing in the semis. But that was just, I remember that win, like no one, everyone counted us out. People were starting to talk about, you know, the spring and, you know, and spring break and things like that. And for us to play, you know, and I was fortunate to have a pretty good game in that you know, that night. And uh, so that just sticks out. I mean, obviously the Lafayette Lehigh games were great. You know, those, that rivalry is awesome. Um, and in high school, did, what was the other one? You player coach. So you talk yeah, player about- in college and as a coach at prep school or college. So yeah, that, well, that was as a player and as a, as a coach in college and we had some good wins, but, Oh, I'll tell you, I'll tell you the, 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 best one was when we beat UMass on the 100th anniversary of college basketball. That was, that was an awesome win up in Springfield. So, but you know, it is if you're in this long enough and, and you're around the right people, you know, it's the whole saying it takes a village. If you can put yourself in a position to be surrounded by good people and learn something from them and, you know, be a sponge and, and, you know, good things will happen. You know, I, Fran O'Hanlon, this is, and, and, Anybody that knows Coach O'Hanlon or has played for him, and you know, certainly I had, you know, I had the opportunity to coach under him. He's he's a mentor of mine. You know, Coach Dumpy, a lot of these, you know, I'm sort of out of that Philly tree in some ways. Um, but he used to say, "Bloom where you're planted." You know, and you, you get enough people blooming where they're planted, and good things happen. So, and and great experiences and lifelong memories. So, basketball's as you know, Corey, we share this. Basketball's just been a you know, we talk about how connected the world is, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's amazing. Just the one degree of separation of basketball. Absolutely. Last one. What's your favorite movie? My favorite movie. You know, it's just funny. I was, I was wondering if I could show my kids space balls yet, but my kid's only four years old. Is that a little too young? We just showed our six and three old ET and that was pushing it. So what'd you say? Yeah. yeah. ET was was a little rough. I like fulfillment. Yeah. (laughs) Um, love, I mean, there's Shawshank Redemption's a good one, but I feel like that might be a cliche answer. Um, but great movie. Yeah. I mean, I, a lot of them, a lot of them. I love, I love, uh, I love documentaries, Corey. 
big in the mm. documentary. So my wife can watch Park and Rec on repeat over and over, which she does, or The Office or anything else. I'm good for like one take on it. And then it's, it's, uh, it's like the next thing, you know, but, yeah. but we actually, we both like documentaries. I just saw Hacking the Gut. Speaking of all this, you know, uh, self-help and, and, you know, health hacks and different things that you and I have talked about on this call. Uh, really interesting. Just the, just the, the added research that's coming down the pipe on, you know, how much influence, uh, you know, on your emotional state, your mind, the GI track has, you know, just the, 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 just the, how interconnected your gut is. And you, and you, we know that, right? Like, it doesn't matter if you're into this type of thing or not, if you don't, you know, research this or look into this or not, we know, obviously, you know, trash in, trash out and the food we eat is very important, but to, to watch this documentary the other night, just, just how crazy connected on your mood and your mind, you know, and your mentality, emotional state, the gut is and has was pretty remarkable to me. So I don't know for what it's worth. It's important stuff. Yeah. Where can people find you online or if they want to get in touch with you or learn more about Chote? Well, obviously, the Chote, I think Chote has a great website. You know, um, I think they've done a good job with that. In fact, I just, our assistant AD said they're going to upgrade it again, which is, I thought it was pretty good to begin with, but that will be exciting to see. And it looks like they're going to put more bells and whistles. So I only say that just from a recruiting standpoint, I think that would be a nice platform for families and, and recruits to go to. Um, they can find, they can email me. I, I have no problems giving my email here, a Dawson at choate.edu. Our, our social media is at Chote Hoops, and that's Twitter and Instagram. I think, you know, we have some of the kids help out with that. I think they do a pretty good job. You know, you can always, there's always something more to do with digital content, but you can get a feel for our program there. And uh, yeah, I think that would be in relative to what we're doing. And, and I've been fortunate in that, again, you wear different hats. I, I have, I am involved in other areas of basketball, but I think for this, you know, I would love, uh, love for, for folks to take a hard look at show so you can find us, you can find me and us there. So. Love it. Well, Drew, thanks so much for coming on the podcast and uh, excited to follow your progress to the future and just keep our friendship going. That sounds good, man. Thanks for having me, Corey. My pleasure. If you guys enjoyed this, please tune in on our podcasting platforms on Spotify, Apple, all the other main ones. Go ahead and subscribe so you don't miss one. Subscribe to our YouTube channel so you can see the bonus content as well as the full form podcasts. And be sure to go to prepathletics.com if you want to learn more about the prep school world or have any questions, you can find out how to reach out to me there. Thanks so much for tuning in. We'll see you next time. Thanks so much. 